Fantastic. All right, amazing folks. How's everybody doing? Silence means perfect, right? It's been the best day ever. You've had such amazing training to start your day out with. All right, well, that's what I love to hear. So uh, my name is Nathan Lachine. I'm a therapeutic foster parent here in Washington State. All that means is that I just work with BRS Youth. Oh, look, I love the sum thumbs up. Perfect. So I'm working with a lot of the teenagers that might be on some of your caseloads. A lot of my kiddos have had multiple placements and you know we're seeing that kids are getting more and more moved around. So this is an incredibly important training because you could be the one person that is consistent in a kid's life. You could be the one person as they're moving from county or region, schools, social workers, right? Social workers are having a huge turnover right now. Some kids are going through four or five social workers while they're in care. You could be that can consistent, dedicated, loving, affirming person that can help this youth as they're moving forward in their exploration of who they truly are. So I've had the amazing privilege and honor of being a foster parent the last 16 years here in Washington. Uh, my husband and I work with teams. I am a, a foster parent recruiter and trainer for an organization called Community Youth Services, where we focus primarily on working with at-risk youth uh, and older youth, and we do a lot of the transitioning out of foster care. So I've got a lot of experience working with youth as they're transitioning into extended foster care, looking at uh, schools or certification routes. So I do a lot of work with youth as they're kind of transitioning. So I also do a lot of work within the um, CSEC and uh, survivor communities as well, because as we know, unfortunately, our youth that are in uh, foster care and system involved are at high risk for abuse and neglect. So there's a huge intersectionality to a lot of the work I do which is why I'm just so grateful to be here today for this, uh, present this training to you. So this is a training uh, that has been around for a little while. I keep updating it every year just to keep it as current as I possibly can. It's really focusing on system involved youth and how we as direct care providers can work with them. So what I mean by that is that youth should never have to out themselves that they're part of the LGBTQIA plus community to know if you're supportive or not. They should be able to get that information just by how you introduce yourself. What do I mean by that? Any new youth that I work with, when I introduce myself, I'm always saying, you know, hey, it's great to meet you, whatever it is. And then it's my name's, you know, Nathan. I use he, him pronouns. So I've had youth go from, oh, I have no idea to what that means for pronouns. So youth that are like, oh, wow, yeah, I use they, them pronouns. I use she, her pronouns. So it's incredibly important, the language that we use and how you introduce yourself. So everyone knows who you are, and especially the kids that you're working with know that you have a basic understanding of pronouns, which then leads into other discussions you can have with you. So since we're talking about introductions, I'd love for everybody, if you feel comfortable, you can take yourself off of mute and just say who you are, the pronouns, and what uh, part of the state you are in, just so I can kind of get an idea of who everybody is. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can always use chat but I hate when people get called out. So hopefully they'll be, you'll all be uh, you know, adventurous and willing to just unmute yourselves and start going around the room saying hi. Hi, Nathan, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Hi, my name is Christy. Um, I'm in Snohomish County. My pronouns are she, her. Fantastic, well, thank you. Thank you for, being, for this starting us off. All right, who's our next brave soul? I'll go next, Nathan. I am Denise Harvey from Southwest Washington, and I prefer uh, pro the pronouns she, her. Fantastic. I'm Skylar Malin. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm in Marysville. Fantastic. Hi. Hi my name's. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. It's fine. Oh. Okay, I'm uh, Mary Morgan. I'm from Clallam County, and I prefer uh, the pronouns she and her. Fantastic, fantastic. Hey, uh, my name is Kathy Kirby. I'm from um, Colville, Washington, in Stevens County. My pronouns are she and her. I'm Carolyn Wyatt, and I'm from Whitman County, and Pullman specifically. And my pronouns that I use are she and her. And my name is Christine Walker, and I'm from Clallam County, and my pronouns are she and her. I am Janet Bellis. I'm from Spokane County, and my pronouns are she and her. Fantastic. 
the same thing. Did everybody get a chance to introduce themselves? Hi, I have been, I'm Jennifer Toby in Price Cities in Benton and Franklin County. My pronouns are she and her. I'm Rochelle Short from Walla Walla County, and I prefer she and her as well. I'm now from King County, and I prefer he, him pronouns. Wow, wow, amazing folks. You all are all around the state, aren't you? Love it. So thank you. All right, we're gonna jump right in. A couple of things I wanna uh, just lay the ground rules. Super casual. I want everybody to shout out if you have questions. If something doesn't make sense to you, I want you to just take yourself off mute and yell out, hey, Nathan, I got a question, or I disagree with that, or expand on that. Because it doesn't matter, you know, in my mind, I think I'm the best trainer you'll ever have, but you know, I'm a little partial to myself. So <laughs> I, but that doesn't mean anything because if I'm not articulating something correctly, it's not ringing true with you. I want you to speak up. I want you to ask those questions. But, so this is also, you get a free pass with me to ask me anything and everything. So I not only am a foster parent, I'm part of the queer community. I was a single parent for a long time. I've also been a victim of sexual abuse. So you can ask me anything and everything as long as you're coming from a point that you want to know and you are like, hey, I, I've always wanted to know this question or I don't know the right way to ask this. You can ask me that. It's okay. I won't get triggered. I want you to ask these questions because it'll help benefit you to have that knowledge and it can help some of the clients that you're serving. So you can ask me anything and everything as long as you are coming from that perspective that you're trying to learn. This is also can be sometimes very challenging uh, topic to discuss. So one, I wanna make sure everybody uh, always remembers self-care. You're all adults. If you need to you know, take an extra breather, please do so. Uh, if you need to you know, grab a quick phone call or whatever, I totally understand it. Or you have a coworker that happens to be of the furry variety and you have to attend to their needs really quick. I totally understand my coworker is my old English bulldog. So you might hear her snoring. But you know that's the best kind of coworker you can have, in my opinion. So I also want to, everybody to recognize that language is ever evolving. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that, especially within the queer community, is that our own definitions are evolving. Our language is evolving. So some of the terminology that I use might not be what this new generation is using. They might also have different pronouns. They might have different words for different things. They might even totally say, you know, what is offensive to me is not offensive to this newer generation. So that's where it becomes really important to ask your client if something doesn't make sense to you or you're not sure you're using it right, ask them, hey, here's what my thought is on this pronoun. Here's how I'm using this definition. They talk to you and they say, you know, they have, they give you a different word for something and you're like, I'm not sure if they even know what they're using it right. Just ask them because this is all about growth as a community, right? We can't know everything. We're always evolving and ever changing. And that's what's amazing within my culture is that it is such a new you know, culture of being able to come out into the public and really start exploring in every generation. The great thing is, is that the ages of coming out are going down. The ages of disclosures are coming down. It's just so fantastic to see. All right, so we're gonna jump right into it. We do have a, a couple of videos and an activity that we're all gonna do as a group. So uh, when I share those videos, if for whatever reason, you know, the sound doesn't come through, somebody just unmute yourself and say, hey, sound's not coming through. Technology is not my uh, strong suit. That's why I married my husband, so I didn't have to worry about technology. All right, here we go, amazing folks. Let's get started. All right. So normally I do this uh, activity uh, in person and some of these activities would be uh, given to you a week or two ahead of time and then we would have group activities that we do. So if we hit an activity slide and I didn't, none of you got the pre-work and the homework and because we're not sitting in tables, makes it hard to do a couple of these. I'll just explain the purpose of those activities because they are important and they do relate very important information. And what I'll do is I will uh, email uh, Ryan all of these activities and some of the handouts and the links. I'll get that off to him uh, later today, as well as a certificate, 
because you will be receiving uh, training hours for this. So I'll get that off to Ryan as well. So he can uh, disperse that to all of you. So big things again, is that we are here to learn. So my role just as facilitating these conversations is to really impart some information, to have a great conversations with everybody. So I do wanna identify is that everybody is gonna have a different lived experiences, right? And how we come into this training is going to be different for all of us because some of us are in rural communities, some of us are not in rural communities. Some of us may be part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Some of us may not. Some of us have only maybe worked with a couple of LGBTQIA plus identifying youth. Maybe some of us, that's our entire caseload. So everybody's gonna have a little bit different perspective. So I wanna make sure that we always respect each other's perspectives. If somebody says something that's hurtful or offensive to another person, you know, we need to just make sure that we're gonna educate the whole group as why that was hurtful or offensive. And we're gonna move forward as a group because again, this is a safe place. I want this to be about knowledge. I want this to be about learning. We are gonna take a couple of breaks in between just because I am a true believer in Zoom fatigue. It is real. So I really try to take a break either, you know, right at the end of the hour, the top of the hour, just, you know, a, little, a couple of five minute breaks uh, in between, just that way we don't get, you know, so tired. You know, it always amazes me is how many of us have been in Zoom presentations and 20 minutes into it, you're like, oh, I got to grab my cell phone and then, you know, hard to stay focused. So we'll take uh, five minute breaks throughout this whole uh, presentation. All right. All right, so we're going to respect where everybody's coming from. We've all had different experiences in life that have shaped, you know, kind of our lens. How do we look at the world? So every one of us has, you know, a different experience, which means we have different knowledge bases. So I just want to make sure that, again, everybody's respecting that we're all coming at this from different perspectives. I really encourage everybody to keep an open mind and super encourage interruptions. You see, interruptions are okay. So if I'm talking about something, presenting something, I would really encourage, I'd love for you all to just feel comfortable enough, take yourself off mute and just go, hey, I've got a question, Nathan. I will monitor chat as best as I can, but sometimes things in chat do get away from me. So if all of us as a group could just kind of commit to if somebody put a question in chat and I haven't answered it in a while, if somebody feels comfortable enough, just unmute yourself and say, hey, look at chat, you got a question. So, all right, amazing folks, before we go any further on this journey, any questions, thoughts, concerns, or are you all out grabbing a cup of tea? Oh, we're gonna have to fix how bashful everybody is. We're gonna, we're gonna be good friends throughout this training. All right, so let's jump right in. So we're gonna start with this video. Uh, this is on um, basic key terms and definitions within the LGBTQIA plus community. So before we jump into this, does anybody know why this training is called LGBTQIA plus? instead of just LGBT or queer or LGBTQ? Does anybody know why I'm using this acronym, the LGBTQIA+. Oh, oh I got a chat. Correct. It's, uh, it is one of the more inclusive uh, ways of ensuring we're representing uh, identities. It's not one of the most inclusive, but it is very inclusive. So great, Skyler, you're on the right track. So the main reason that we use LGBTQIA+, is that that is the correct acronym that the state of Washington, BCYF, is using. So that started this year. So you'll see all their documents are going to all start saying LGBTQIA+. So DCYF is over early uh, childhood learning. They're over uh, JR. So you'll see that their documents also all say LGBTQIA+. So there is multiple, multiple different versions of this. Does anybody know some of the other versions? If you wanna just type them in chat, let's see what you all know. Let's see if anybody gets the, the most inclusive one out there now. Anybody? All right. So I'll, I'll be the first one I'll show you. This is one of the most inclusive ways of identifying uh, people within kind of the alphabet. So native LGBTQIA2S plus is one of the more inclusive ways, especially here in Washington state. It very much is inclusive of native culture. So we'll kind of deep dive some of that information about our native cultures and our uh, native 
uh, people. So let's go ahead and let's start our training off with this video. So it does go a little fast. And I do want to preface it that right after this video, we're going to do a matching game for definitions. So it really helps if you're paying attention. And if you write down some of the definitions that might be new to you, so you can win our definitions matchup game we're going to do next. So I'm going to get the video started. Again, if sound doesn't come through, somebody just unmute yourself and say, hey, the sound's not working. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this super neat introduction to some concepts within the LGBT community. There are so many buzzwords, vocabulary, and definitions floating around in the media, it can be hard to dissect what it all means. So, this brief video will introduce you to some basic concepts. Okay, there's a lot to get through. First, the LGBTQ plus acronym. Let's break that down. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally. Now, all of these words deal with one of four key traits every person, queer or not, has. Biological sex is the physical anatomy with which you were born. Gender identity is the personal feeling and conceptualization of one's own gender on the spectrum between male and female. Sexual orientation is the gender to which a person is attracted, either romantically or sexually, in relation to their own. Gender expression is how a person chooses to outwardly show their gender identity. In simple terms, Biological sex, what you have, gender identity, what you feel, sexual orientation, who you love, gender expression, how you look and act. Okay, we just broke down the acronym and we talked about the four traits. Now let's put them together. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and asexual refer to sexual orientation. Intersex refers to differences in biological sex, which can also be related to being transgender. And both of those are related to gender identity. Queer is an umbrella term used by most of the community to refer to anyone who identifies as part of the community. Questioning refers to people who are, you guessed it, still questioning their sexuality or gender. Allies are non-queer folk who support and love the queer community. Now, the first idea to talk about is that of a spectrum. The LGBTQ community widely accepts that the four aforementioned traits are all on a spectrum, a scale between two opposite points. Traits can fall on either extreme or anywhere in between. All right, let's jump in and start with terms relating to gender identity. First, biological sex. The extremes on this spectrum are biological male and female. These are determined mainly by hormones and organs. For males, this means testosterone, a penis, testes, and secondary sex characteristics like body and facial hair and a lower voice. For females, this means estrogen, a vagina, and the internal reproductive organs for pregnancy. Female secondary sex characteristics include breasts, wider hips, and a higher voice. Intersex is the term used to describe people whose combination of hormones, internal sex organs, and genitals do not fit typical binary notions of male or female bodies. Gender, another spectrum, is the scale between boy and girl. Boys may use masculine pronouns, he, him, his, and feel masculine. Girls use she, her, her pronouns and feel feminine. Anyone who identifies outside the gender binary falls under the umbrella term of gender queer. Halfway between the extremes is gender neutral. This means someone who identifies as neither a man nor a woman. They often choose neutral pronouns, they, them, their, or a variation of the invented pronouns, z, zer, z. Someone who is gender fluid may identify differently at different times. A bi-gender person lives their life at both extremes at different times, living both as a man and as a woman. With both gender fluid and bi-gender people, it is important to listen and respect the appropriate pronoun for the situation. Agender people don't identify with any gender and often use gender neutral pronouns. So, we already established that gender identity is the gender you feel inside. When your internal gender identity matches your born biological sex, that's called cisgender. If they don't match, transgender. Transgender people experience gender dysphoria, or the uncomfortable feeling that their mind and body don't match. Often, trans people will choose to transition, using hormone replacement therapy and or various surgeries to change their bodies to match their identity. It is never okay to ask a trans person where they are in their transition. If they want you to know, they'll tell you. Mind-body alignment also lies on a spectrum. Gender expression is how people choose to show their gender to the outside world. 
This refers to the ways in which we each manifest masculinity or femininity. It is usually an extension of gender identity. Each of us expresses a particular gender every day. The clothes we wear, how we style our hair, or even the way we stand. Drag kings and queens are people who explore gender as an art form. <coughs> their cross-dressing is a form of gender expression, but you cannot assume anything about their gender identity or sexual orientation based on how they choose to dress. Speaking of sexual orientation, that's our last spectrum, and it refers to whom you are attracted. On one end, we have heterosexual, or attraction to someone of the opposite gender. Opposingly, there is homosexual, or attraction to the same gender. In between is bisexual, attraction to both genders. Pansexuality is attraction to all genders, including those that lay outside the binary. Someone who is asexual is not attracted to any gender. Attraction can be broken down even further into both romantic and sexual. One is an emotional attraction, the other is physical. These attractions do not always have to align. For example, someone can be panromantic, emotionally attracted to all genders, but asexual, not physically attracted to any gender. There are several other, more nuanced prefixes. Demi, scolio, poly, to name a few. Other genders, such as third gender and two-spirit, also exist. Some of these identities can be confusing and hard to understand if you've never been exposed to them before. But if a person defines themselves in a way that is new to you, it is okay, even important, to respectfully ask what that identity means to them. These are just a few of some offensive and hurtful terms that are used to describe some people in the LGBT community. These terms are mostly old-fashioned and are often used out of ignorance rather than malice. However, they can all be slurs used maliciously on purpose to hurt people's feelings. But the biggest message you should take away from this video is the importance of letting someone define their own gender and sexuality. Respect their pronouns, respect their chosen name, respect their appearance, and respect their choice in partners. Share this video on your favorite social media platform and spread the word. Use these new vocab words to define yourself. I am a gay, cisgender female. Who are you? All right, folks. So what do we think of that? Were any of those new terms for anybody? Yes, I learned a few new terms I had never heard. Anybody disagree with any of the definitions that were presented? I think it was pretty good. There are a few places where it's like, it depends on who you ask. Um, I know some people define bisexuality differently. Um, and there's a lot of like, there's kind of like a fine line between pansexuality and bisexuality. Um, and there were a couple other things where, you know, they, you know, they didn't really have a like spectrum between asexuality and like allosexuality, but, you know, they did kind of talk about it, but it is also considered to be a spectrum. So there are a couple areas, but I would say it's pretty comprehensive, especially for people who don't have a lot of experience with it. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you brought up the point of um, pan and bi. Those, you know, because those are very, there's very little nuance between them. And it also brings up is that every generation is adapting, changing, and tweaking the definitions to better fit them. So that's, again, where it comes back to knowing your audience, because some of these definitions uh, that I'm going to read off and do uh, with all of us this game, I don't personally agree with them. I think there, some of them are a little outdated, but that's, you know, the interesting thing is, again, how quickly things are evolving right in front of our eyes right now. So really appreciate those comments. Does anybody else have any feedback they'd like to share with the group? Do you have a link to the video? It went by really fast, but it was a lot of, uh, a lot of information. It's new to me. Yep, I'm gonna, um, I, I will find it when we uh, go to our first break. I'll actually find the uh, YouTube link so you can just uh, watch it as many times as you want. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, if nobody else has thoughts they'd like to share with the group, we'll get started on our big group activity. So this is one of my favorite ones. This is also where I used to be able to have candy and little pride stickers and pass them out. And we used to keep score as a group, but 
we'll just do this exercise all as one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read out a definition and you, what you need to do is go ahead and just, everybody can unmute themselves now if they feel comfortable to, or they can put it in chat, but uh, I won't be checking chat as often as I'll be listening for the right answer. So I'm gonna read a definition and what your goal is, is just to match it up to one of the key words or terms that's up here, okay? All right, so first one, this is, we're, we're giving you a little underhanded softball throw. So just to get the juices flowing. First one is, describes an individual whose gender identity and gender expression match the gender typically associated with their biological sex, often abbreviated as cis. Cisgender. Exactly, cisgender. So that is, a, that is a good one we could discuss putting in here. Uh, the challenge that I have with this curriculum is that any of the updates has to get peer reviewed. So it takes a while, but uh, I will definitely add non-binary non on there as well. Giving myself a note right now. Thank you, Skylar. So next term is a term used in some Native American communities for persons who identify with gender roles of both men and women and were considered a separate or a third gender? Two-spirit. Two-spirit. Does anybody know the history of two-spirit? Anybody want to take a stab at how old that term is when it was first uh, utilized and when it was becoming mainstream? So two-spirit actually um, started coming around in the 90s as being a way of representing for native cultures. Some of the challenges that we do have, um, and I'm not part of the native, communi native communities, and I've been just working on getting education around this, is that we have over 500 federally recognized tribes and bands. Out of those groups, um, most of them don't have actual pronouns within those groups because they don't have identifiers for male and female like we do as, a, uh, as our dominant culture. So challenges that we run into is that two spirits only recognized by certain tribes. So some tribes didn't even, have, they don't have gender language. So when working with, uh, especially native youth, it's always important to remember that, is that LGBTQIA plus can actually be considered offensive within the tribal communities because they don't use gender language in their community. So how do you relate that somebody is gay or lesbian or trans if that, if that word doesn't exist in their culture and their language? So that's why when we kind of started this off and I showed everybody uh, a new, more inclusive way of saying it of native LGBTQIA2S plus. So that recognizes that younger generations do recognize the LGBTQIA plus. It recognizes that some native cultures don't have any gender language. So we want to be inclusive of them as well. And it does recognize two spirit. Any questions on that? I know that that's really kind of a complicated thought process. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. So the assignment and classification of people as male, female, intersex, or another sex based on a combination of anatomy, hormones, and chromosomes. This assignment is a sex marker placed on an individual's birth certificate at birth. What's that process called? Biological. It is uh, the biological, yep, it's their biological sex. But that process would be called a sex assigned at birth. So that's just that process where, you know, medical professionals make a visual determination and mark a box. What uh, boxes on a birth certificate are available here in Washington state? Uh, is it male, female, or X? Exactly. So you have the traditional male and female, and then you have the gender X marker that's now available as well. So youth that are in uh, foster care can have their birth certificates updated and their IDs to reflect that for the gender X marker. So one of the things that our program does is that our youth that are uh, exploring and moving into their true self and getting ready to age out of foster care, our agency really focuses on getting all of their IDs updated, right? Isn't it just a nightmare to try to get anything through Social Security Administration, DL, and, ooh, Skyler, yes, good. Andrew using the 4.0 version of the gender bred person. We actually will be covering that. Uh, so we really encourage that we get all their IDs updated because I can't tell you how hard it is even for me to navigate some of the paperwork in the system. 
So when the kids are still in system involved and they have an attorney, that attorney can help you get the court orders. That attorney can help fill out the paperwork and really push that forward. So when youth leave our program, their chosen name is on all of their legal documents, their gender marker has been updated and we've really prepped them for success. All right, next one, an umbrella term used to describe anyone whose gender identity situates them differently than the traditional sex they were assigned at birth. Queer. I'm sorry, what? Is it queer? Nope, queer is, uh, again, this is gender. one of the subtle nuances, but. Or gender, queer. No, pretty close, you're on the right track. It's actually transgender. Oh. So this is kind of a definition. Um, very older definition of an umbrella term used to describe anyone whose gender identity situates them differently than the sex they were assigned at birth. So that would be transgender. All right, so this one, a gender, a general term used to describe individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual. What is that called? What's that? L LGBTQIA+. Exactly. So uh, the LGBTQIA+, there's multiple versions of we've all kind of discussed. So it's also sometimes known as just the alphabet soup. There are some versions of this that are incredibly inclusive and they have up to 20 letters within them. Uh, with this training, we're gonna be sticking to what uh, DCYF and the state uses. So that's just the LGBTQIA+. Again, knowing their, your audience and who you're working with. So some generations, older generations, they might just be comfortable just using the, the term gay. That was an all-encompassing term. Uh, then it's kind of morphed into having the LGBT, LGBT and then LGBTQ. And then they, we keep adding letters to it to show inclusivity within you know, our marginalized society. So knowing you're, who you're talking to, they may have different terms. They may add more letters to it. Uh, and maybe they don't recognize the uh, I or the A or the plus. So just know your audience. Anyone have questions on that? All right. Next one, a woman who has a continuing, enduring, emotional, romantic, and affectionate attraction for other women is? Lesbian. Lesbian. Yep. So if we took away the physical attraction, would they, that person still be a lesbian? So if they were able to have an emotional connection, a romantic connection, but they just didn't want to have a sexual connection with that woman, would they still be considered a lesbian? Yes. Okay. That's, you know, some of the nuances. And that's something I really want everybody to understand is that that emotional romantic connections is kind of one part of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So those are you know, two very different aspects of, you know, our attraction for somebody, right? So if you probably noticed that some of the new clinics uh, are becoming more inclusive, where they're actually asking and breaking down those questions and asking who are you romantically attracted to and who are you sexually attracted to physically. So the reasons they're asking that is to really make sure that the providers are giving appropriate healthcare information to the kids and to the young adults. Because if somebody is not, you know, they could be asexual, they could be have more attractions towards males or females, but they don't sleep with a male or a female, they sleep with a different gender or vice versa. So it's really important to have those breakdowns. And I'm starting to see them a lot more within the uh, community healthcare system. So the foster adopt clinics that have popped up uh, around Washington state are really good. They're the ones that I've seen mostly start to use the longer forms and have those delineators where they're asking more detailed questions. All right, so continuing emotional, romantic, and affectionate attraction to persons of the same and opposite sex. What's that keyword? Bisexual. Exactly. So bisexual means that they have emotional, romantic, uh, and affectionate attractions to people of the same and opposite sexes. A term used to describe gender language that an individual wants others to use when referring to that individual, such as he, him, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs. People may use other words as well. What are those called? Pronouns. Exactly. So pronouns are, are incredibly important and we need to respect them. 
Does anybody know how often DCYF social workers have to update the youth file with the correct pronoun, gender expression, and chosen name? How often? So a youth has a right to have their paperwork and information updated every single time they see that social worker. So state DCYF policy is that they when and where they can, they are supposed to keep that information updated and update paperwork. So incredibly important. What you'll also see some of our youth do that our youth will combine pronouns as they're kind of exploring and learning about themselves. So it's very common uh, for kids to combine like he, she, she, they, they, him, kind of any of those combinations or even add uh, there are new pronouns out there. The zeros. Has anyone had a youth uh, use the zeros? Z, zeros, zeros? Oh, I haven't either. So th those are out there as well. What you'll find a lot of times uh, with youth as they get more comfortable, they might change their pronouns or they might have combinations. So several of my boys, if I'm talking with them and they're around people that they really trust and care, they'll use um, he, she, he, they as their pronouns or just they. But when it's a new person, they might, you know, say they only use the pronouns of, you know, he, him. So again, it just kind of comes back to that comfort level of the youth and the environment that they're in. As, so when you all are getting uh, referrals in the paperwork, has it ever said uh, a youth's pronoun, chosen name, if they're part of the LGBTQI plus community, does anybody have that in their files? Good. Um, so DCYF actually has a specific policy that uh, they are not allowed to actually out a youth unless the youth has given consent for what information to share and it is documented by the social worker. So there's an actual DCYF policy that uh, unfortunately our state was violating and they were releasing in foster care groups for placement desk purposes, a youth sexual orientation, uh, that they're part of the queer community, their pronouns. There was one post that they even said, you know, male identifying problem is they sleep with males. And this was put out onto a Facebook group. So it's an actual um, DCYF policy out there. It's uh, 5,600, I believe. And that one specifically says that a youth has to give consent to the social worker of what information and who they can disclose it to. And the social worker has to have it documented in family. So if you ever see paperwork of a referral with a kiddo and discussing their SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, I'd really encourage you to take that as a learning opportunity with that social worker and go, hey, uh, did Susie give you consent to do give out this information? Oh, yeah, she told me six weeks ago or whatever. Okay, did, do you have this documented? Because you have to have this documented to ensure that the use rights are being protected. So if you run into any challenges with social workers on uh, violations of SOGI, just let me know. I'm more than happy to help you out with it. All right, next one. The act or process of voluntarily disclosing one's sexual orientation or gender identity. What's this process called? Coming out. Exactly. So coming out is not a once and done for a lot of youth. They might come out several times throughout their lives might come out later in life. They might come out as a juvenile. It just depends on where that kid is, their comfort level, their knowledge level, the sport that's around them. It's very common too for youth to come out as uh, bisexual, pansexual, to see what gauge your response when they actually know they're actually trans or they're actually gay or they're lesbian or they're whatever. Because a lot of times they want to see how are you going to respond? Are you going to go over the top? Are you going to be all oh, that's so amazing and you're just that loving, supportive and affirming person that they need in their life? Or are you gonna be, unfortunately, what probably history, historically has taught these kids is that us adults are not safe people. So don't be surprised if a youth does come out and disclose that information. Um, I also would encourage that that information doesn't have to be shared unless there's a, you know, an immediate safety or health concern with it. I would encourage keeping it as confidential as you can because that youth trusted you. How would you feel if you've been moved around and this is your 15th through 20th, your 30th placement, and something that personal about who you are as a human being is shared by the department and you don't even get access and the right to restrict that information? 
be traumatizing. So I would encourage you to keep that information as confidential as you can within your policies and procedures and work groups. All right, next definition is an individual who is only or primarily emotionally, romantically, and sexually attracted to the opposite sex is? Homosexual. Or gay. Hetero. Hetero. So heterosexual. <laughs> I think I think you knew exactly what you're going with, Jennifer. It's just yeah, started off on one. No, 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 it's great. Um, yeah, heterosexuals, uh, you know, identify as male. I'm only or primarily attracted to females, or I'm a female and I'm primarily only attracted to males. So that's heterosexual. All right, next one. An individual's outward communication of gender through behavior or appearances may or may not correspond with their biological sex assigned at birth. What is this? Gender expression. Gender expression. Exactly. Bonus points for everybody for gender expression because you knew that. So what are some of the gender expressions that we all are doing right now in our culture? Clothing. The way yep. we dress. Yep. Makeup. Makeup. Yep, exactly. So those are kind of the big ones. Uh, some of the other are, you know, mannerisms that we consider acceptable, not acceptable in our culture. How, uh, you know, some of the traditional like, you know, dating rituals that we have, you know, that the boy is always supposed to ask the girl out. And, you know, when you do prom and homecoming, you're supposed to wear certain things. You're supposed to bring a flower corsets, those kind of things. Our marriage rituals, a lot of this is really driven by our dominant culture but it changes depending on where you are. So, you know, right now, if I was wearing a lot of makeup, you, you know, people could make assumptions. Well, originally makeup was designed, you know, in the theater and was worn by thespians and by the ultra rich. High heel shoes, where did they come from? High heel shoes were primarily worn by men in the middle ages for riding and to also make the aristocrats look taller. Any other examples that you all can think of? Hairstyles. Yep, hairstyles. You know, what, what comes to mind if you see, you know, somebody with, especially, a, you know, what looks to be a male identifying person with long hair? You start making assumptions. If I say, hey, think of, you know, a manly man, think of a, a woman. We all kind of in our minds, I have a perception, right? How much is that shaped by, you know, our culture? So gender reveal parties. Why is that such a huge thing here in our culture? So originally the color for boy was pink and the color for girls was blue. It just, it changed in our culture, but now we would never give a kid a pink gift or pink color, right? The clothing we wear, baby's clothes are a perfect example. So most youth up until ages three to five would wear dresses. Why? Anybody know the answer? Think about like the middle ages, the 16, 18, 1900s. Why would all kids usually up until ages three to five would be wearing a dress? Because it's practical, right? A dress could be used for multiple kids. Also, dresses can be made a little bit bigger, so you're not having to change clothes for the kiddo. It's only recently that our big retail establishments got together and said, oh, no, 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 no. Boys wear pants, girls wear dresses. Think of it now as a marketing. So if I was a retailer and I only sold one item, that's all I can sell. And now if I, we have this huge push that boys wear pants, girls wear dresses, don't I have a 50-50 shot with every kid born that a parent has to buy some new clothes? Can't do hand-me-downs? Yep. So, so much of what we see as what we call quote-unquote kind of normal and as part of the dominant culture we're in is really shaped by that culture. So media shapes things. The magazines, you know, one of the greatest examples of this is razors. So for the, you know, most of the existence of razors, it was for men, right? Shave our beards, try to get our faces lined up without cutting ourselves. But after 
World War I and World War II, the razor companies, especially after World War II, were heavily investing in advertising to women. And they sold one of the greatest farces of our generation was, oh yeah, Europeans shave their armpits and shave their legs. It's a European fashion. It's sexy, it's beautiful. And look what's happened now. They opened up a whole new market segment, right? And so many people in our culture here associate, well, women shouldn't have any underarm hair, shouldn't have leg hair. Yeah, yeah, kiss use makeup and they still wear high heels. I don't know, some of those uh, platform shoes they have, I don't know how they don't fall. So we need to remember that our cultural norms are set by the dominant culture. So if you go over to another country, it's not a big a deal for two guys to be holding hands and walking down the street that are just friends. Think of what cultures around the world is it appropriate when you're greeting a guest to give them a kiss on the cheek. If I went up to anybody in this room and you know, said, hey, great to meet you, and I try to give you a kiss, we're probably going to have an issue, right? But in other cultures, that's a cultural norm. Think about some cultures where if a youth is actually looking the adult in the eye, it's considered extremely rude and disrespectful, and kids are never supposed to look at the adult in the eye. They're supposed to look at the floor, especially when they're in trouble. It's a sign of respect. Okay, but what does our culture do? The kid's not making eye contact with you. Don't we immediately go, oh, you're being disrespectful. You need to look at me. That's where those cultural norms come in. That's where you have to know your client and know what is a cultural norm that they might be experiencing. And we can't make those assumptions. All right. Next one. An umbrella term used to describe some individuals who identified as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender neutral, questioning, and other identities. While in the past, this was a derogatory term, many individuals and groups are reclaiming it as an all-encompassing way of describing those who do not identify as heterosexual or cisgender. Pansexual? Close. Pansexual is really talking about um, desires for um, who you're romantically and sexually attracted to. Queer. 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 Exactly. So queer. So this is one of those terms that I'm not a super big fan of because to me, I grew up in that generation where somebody called me a queer or a fag. Those are fighting words. I grew up in a small rural community and it wasn't that I was a fighter or that I was particularly good at it. It was that it, there were physical consequences if I was known as the gay kid on campus. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of queer and fag, but Fast forward a couple of years ago, one of my kids was going out to the skate park and, you know, just grabbing his shoes or whatever he was doing as walking out of the house, like, you know, hey, where are you going? And he goes, oh, I'm just going to the skate park to hang out with my fags. I was like, whoa, 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 come back here. We need to talk. What do you, what do you mean? And literally, I can't do it. You know, did that eye roll, head roll kind of thing, getting the sturdy looking like, they're gay, I'm gay, they're gay, they're my fags, I'm going to the park to hang out with my fags. So younger generations have really reclaimed some of these terms. So again, it's really important to know your audience and know what their comfort level is because I would never refer to any of my LGBTQI plus identifying friends as my gays or my queers. I, I just think it's very, it's offensive to me, but some generations have reclaimed it and it's not. Nathan, can you please repeat that definition? Because I struggle as somebody of that era as well. It was such a negative connotation yep. for me growing up. Yeah, it really was. It was, and it was always used as a very hurtful way. It's like faggot in my brain. Having a lesbian mother in the 80s, it was, yeah, it was a painful word. Yeah, so the, uh, I, I agree with you 110%. So the definition for queer that we're using is an umbrella term used to describe individuals who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender neutral, questioning, and other identities. While in the past this was a derogatory term, many individuals and groups are reclaiming it as an all-encompassing way to describe those who do not identify as heterosexual and or cisgender. Thank you. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it, it definitely is. And you know what I can do is I can, I'll make a note for myself. So when I send the email to Ryan, I'll send the definition matchups 
uh, as well. So you'll all have these definitions. Thank you. All right. Next one, a term of self-identification for people who do not identify with the limited and binary terms that have traditionally described gender identity. For instance, the male man or female woman binary. Bonus points if anybody gets this right off the first guess. Gender non-conforming. Close. It's gender queer. So let me read that back to everybody again. So gender queer is a term of self-identification for people who do not identify with the limited and binary terms that have traditionally described gender identity. For instance, the male man or the female woman binary. All right, next one. A man who has a continuing, enduring, emotional, romantic, and affectionate relationship for other men is? A homosexual. Exactly. All right. So next one describes an individual whose combination of sex chromosomes, gonads, internal reproductive organs, and external genitalia are not typical according to the medical community of female or male. Gender nope, this is this actually has a biological component to it. So intersex, intersex, exactly. So let me read it back to you again. So an intersex person is described as an individual whose combination of sex chromosomes, gonads, internal reproductive organs, and external genitalia are not typical according to the medical community of female or male. So Literally, what that means is that a youth is the doctors don't know back in the day. And when I mean back in the day, I'm meaning even into the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, doctors would get a ruler out and look at a clitoris or the penis and measure and say, oh, this was an underdeveloped penis. It must have been, it was supposed to be a clitoris. This is an overdeveloped clitoris. It must have been supposed to be a penis. And they would actually recommend to the parents to have a surgery immediately. So the medical community, and this is here in the United States, took the stance it was better to do a medical intervention on sometimes only weak old babies, weeks. What do we know about major surgery? It's incredibly dangerous, right, for anybody, but to put a kid under anesthesia at being only several weeks old, high risk. The doctors would do this. The doctors would then advise the parents to never discuss this with the kid. What do we think happens when a kid finds out that their entire family has been lying to them? So a lot of youth that were intersex, unfortunately, in the early part of the 20th century had a lot of mental health challenges, had high rates of suicide. So what do we fast forward? What do we learn now? Now we have learned is that unless there's a medical reason for an intervention and medical intervention, the most common area of concern is going to be for um, urinary tract infections and checking the urinary pathways to make sure that they're fully developed. If there's not a medical reason, the doctors cannot perform the surgery. So it is considered genital mutilation to perform the surgery on intersex youth. What we have now found is that it is much more healthy and beneficial to the youth to allow them to grow up, allow them to be their true authentic self. And if they make the choice that they would like to have affirming surgery, they can do that. One of the biggest things with the internet is social media. So a lot of intersex youth and intersex adults are actually being able to connect with each other. They're able to form communities and see that they're not alone. And more importantly, that you can be a healthy, happy, successful person as an intersex. It's not, it's nothing wrong with you. A lot of their bodies will balance themselves out and they will be able to choose who they want to be in without having to have surgical interventions. One of the challenges that we really have is really trying to get a, you know, how many kids are born intersex. So I was actually uh, surprised and I think the number is still underreported but roughly 1.7% of youth uh, born 
are identified as uh, atypical. So that really kind of caught me off guard, that roughly 1.7%. So depending on what study you look at, that could be every one in 16,000, one in 20,000, somewhere in there, used to be the statistics that were out there. Um, it's very hard to get good data on it just because there's still unfortunately a lot of shame around this issue. There's a fantastic book out there um, and I'll grab it off my library shelf in a, uh, when we come back from break, it's called Raising Rosie. This book is all about a family that was up in Canada and they had uh, two children, a boy and a girl, and then they decided to have a third and Rosie was born as intersex. And luck of the draw was is that Rosie's mom was an RN, Rosie's dad was a researcher and a professor. And when the doctors came in and said, hey, we need to do the surgery immediately, you never need to talk to uh, Rosie about this, of how they were born, and it's going to be, you know, this is for the best for this child. Both parents said, hold on, we need to find research, we need to find data to back up your claims. Guess what? They couldn't find any research or data to back up those claims. So thankfully, Rosie is choosing in the book to continue to identify as a female, but there's been no problems with Rosie's health. There's been no problems with Rosie making connections. And Rosie, even uh, to the point in the book, was doing public speaking on this topic as well. So I'll uh, grab my copy of it off my shelf uh, and have it so everybody can see it, but it's called Raising Rosie. You should be able to get it online. All right, next one. Describes an individual who is emotionally, romantically, and sexually attracted to individuals of all gender identities and expressions, including those that do not fit into the standard gender binary of man and woman. Pansexual. Pansexual. Pansexual is so important to me, and it's such a beautiful thing, because when I was growing up, when my parents knew that I was uh, part of the LGBTQI plus community, my parents were always telling me, love that woman for who she is, for the mind, for the emotion, because the body fades, right? This is only temporary. You want to love that person for that like heart and soul is always what my parents told me. And that's what I see pansexuality as, that you can truly love a person for that inner heart and soul and that emotions and the intellectual and all of that is, you know, what you love, not this outer shell. So I think pansexual is just one of the most beautiful of all of the terms we're covering today. Does anybody know the difference between bisexual and pansexual? With bisexual, you're either attracted to a male or female in the, the two binary gender sense of the word. Pansexual can be attraction to male or female or transgender, trans people. Exactly. So bisexual is, you know, you're still believing in that binary of male and female. Pansexual means you can love anyone. Yeah, Catherine, uh, difference depends on who you ask. Uh, for a lot of these, it really is going to be that. Um, that's the biggest difference between the pansexual and the bisexual is just that bisexual is still believing in that binary and they only love men and women, whereas pansexual can love any gender identity and expression. So just very subtle differences. All right, next one is, describes an individual whose gender expression does not correspond with their biological sex assigned at birth. So this is a super nuanced one. Who's brave and wants to take a stab at this? This one gender non-confirming. Oh my gosh, Jennifer, you're one of the few people that ever get this right. Congratulations. Yes, so this is gender non-conforming because it's their gender expression isn't conforming to what's on their birth certificate. So what do I mean by that? So if on my birth certificate, it's, it was marked female and I'm talking to you and I'm dressed this way and my mannerisms are this way, I'm presenting as opposite of what is on my birth certificate because it's just the expression that's how I'm expressing my gender through my clothes, my mannerisms, facial hair, my wearing of makeup or lack of wearing of makeup. All right, next one, an individual who does not experience sexual attraction, but may experience emotional or romantic attraction is? Asexual. Exactly, asexual. So can asexual person or persons still have a loving and committed relationships? Yes. Yeah. Heck yeah. 
You definitely can. Sex is just one component of having your, you know, that relationship. Can you still have be connected to that person emotionally? Heck yes, you can. Can you still be attracted to that person? Heck yes, you can. You just don't have a physical desire to have sex. All right. Oh, we're down to our last three. People or a person who are exploring or in the process of discovering their sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. What's that called? Questioning. Exactly, that questioning. So for a lot of kids now, they have a lot more freedom to information, right? They have the internet. Internet theoretically has almost everything out, uploaded to it. You know, my generation, I did not have the internet. Also, what representation back in the 80s and even in the 90s did I have to look up to for as a gay male? What was, you know, our societal views on gay males? AIDS. Wasn't very, <laughs> was not acceptable. The AIDS yep. epidemic was a major factor, I recall, of the 80s in gay men. Yep. Do you know with specifically that I still as a gay male cannot give blood? Yeah. So to this day, I am not allowed to give blood because I engage in one sexual act. Guess what? Heterosexual people engage in it too. But because I identify as a gay male, I am banned from giving blood. But don't we test everybody's blood? Mm -hmm. I am still banned. And that's still, that is to this day. The American Red Cross has said they're in a phase of researching it to see if they should have that ban. European, especially in the UK, they have the ban as well that gay males cannot give blood. But yet we know that's not, anybody can have HIV and AIDS. Right. That blows my mind that that's still a thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredibly challenging. And, you know, I would love to give blood and I would love to, you know, be able to support and give back to the community and I can't. All right, next one describes a sexual orientation in which a person feels physically and emotionally attracted to people of the same sex. Homosexual? Yep. Homosexual, homosexuality, correct. So that is just that a person that identifies and they identify the exact same uh, identity, they're just homosexual. Last one. An individual's inner sense of being a man, woman, or another gender. This may or may not correspond with an individual's biological sex assigned at birth. Gender identity. Exactly. So let's break that down because a couple we've covered all those, but I really want to make sure. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's still restricted. So I'm hoping to see that change, but I don't think it's gonna change anytime soon for uh, gay males to be able to give blood. So on gender identity, so part of our SOGI is our inner identity of what I think my sexuality is and who I, what my gender is as a person. So that's gender identity, my inner thoughts. My gender expression is how I express that to the world. And through expression could be hairstyle, clothing styles, mannerisms, how I speak, how I carry myself. Those are all expressions of my gender identity. So that's the differences between the gender identity is my inner thought. Gender expression is how I express that to the world. All right, folks, so we got through the first part of this activity. What do we all think about it? A lot to take in. It really is. And some of these definitions don't apply to the, to the youth nowadays. Uh, some of them don't apply to, you know, older generations, younger generations. So it's always important to really touch bases with whoever you're working with and try to get on a common language and definitions because our vocabulary has power to it. And we want to make sure that we are communicating to our LGBTQIA plus clients as appropriately as we possibly can. So I've got notes. I'll make sure that I send out the definitions uh, when I send out the certificates so Ryan will have them so we can get them to everybody else. So any other final thoughts on this uh, definitions matchup? Nathan, you're using the term SOGI. Mm -hmm. 
Can you explain that acronym or slow it down? <laughs> so SOGI is, uh, unfortunately, I like you know acronyms, and uh, now that I've been working with nonprofit in the states, we have acronyms for everything. So SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. So all of this that we're discussing is part of a person's SOGI because it's part of their sexual identity expressions. So I actually have, so we have a worksheet that I'll be showing everybody and I can send along the gender bread person. And then I have uh, the dimensions of identity that we're gonna be covering. And I have a worksheet that specifically talks about SOGI a little bit later in this presentation. But SOGI is just another way of talking about kind of all encompassing that we are working on somebody's sexual identity, their orientation and expression. Thank so, you. Gosh, I know. Thank you for asking. I shouldn't make assumptions that we all know what SOGI is. It's bad on me. No worries. I'll make sure you all have the definition match up so you can look at this as uh, often as you need to. And, you know, honestly, this is a good thing of, I've actually used this with a couple of my kids to help me update it years ago. Like, here's what I'm working with. And my kid's like, nope, that's not what we refer to it. So it's really good to understand that this is really kind of a, a moving target to always make sure that we are making sure we are appropriate and using the right definitions and terminology uh, with the clients we serve. So uh, like I said, I like to take a lot of five minute breathers. So let's see, what time is it right now? Yeah. See, screen stop. All right, so it's eight after. So. Now, and after. why don't we just come back at 15 and after everybody? So I will see everybody at 2.15.